Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Before I begin, I want to say this. In the light of eternity, our lives are a vapor. It's here today, and it's gone tomorrow, kind of like a teapot. You got the steam, you grab a hold of it, and it's gone. We only have so many opportunities to glorify God by making Yeshua known. I hope this message will touch you, and I hope in the end that you get making Yeshua known is the most important thing we can do, whether it's to our family, to strangers, to people across the world, or people within this congregation. As you know, the Olympics just started in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, from August the 5th to August the 21st, there's going to be 206 nations participating, 201 countries who have qualified at least one athlete, and there's around 10,000 athletes who have participated in the Olympics. Many of these athletes train six days a week, six hours a day. They watch everything they eat. They watch their sleep. They go through this for years just to win the ultimate prize, a perishable crown. But see, not only that, They have millions of people from all around the world watching them, cheering them on. They have people coming from their own country, coming to Brazil to cheer them on for a perishable crown. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, Rav Shaul, Apostle Paul says this, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to attain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I have a question for you guys. As believers in Messiah Yeshua Jesus, what race are you and I running? Are we running the the race that God has set before us? Is there anything in your life, in my life, keeping us from running that race? Do we know how much it's going to cost us to run the race, to share Yeshua, make Yeshua known? You see, they may have millions of people watching the Olympics. They may have people traveling to the Olympics and training and and, uh, coming to cheer on the athletes, their own countrymen, but we have angels cheering us on to finish the race. We have people that have come before us who have ran the race cheering us on. So if you're alone and you're tired, remember you have people who are cheering you on that have ran the race before you and you have the angels in heaven cheering you on. See, as believers in Yeshua, we are called to run the ultimate race for an imperishable crown, an eternal prize, eternal prize. See, there are many people throughout history who have ran the ultimate race but I want to look at just three people in their lives briefly, briefly how they ran the ultimate race. When I think about the Olympics, what do you think about the Olympics? The chariots of fire, right? Eric Little, the, the, right? The music, the sound. But see, he was more than just an Olympian. He was more than just an Olympian. He was a follower of Yeshua. He stood up for Yeshua. See, he, even though we keep the Shabbat, right? He said he would not run on Sunday. He said his best race was 100 meters long, and he said he wasn't going to run on that race. So he decided not to run. But what happened was God opened the door for him to run the 200 and 400 meter race another day, and he won a bronze and a gold medal. (laughs) Right? (laughs) See, he was he was a follower of Yeshua. He promoted Yeshua. He talked about Yeshua. He, 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 he gave speeches about Yeshua Dur- before the Olympics, during the Olympics, and after the Olympics. And after the Olympics, see, Eric Bourne was born in China. After the Olympics, he went to China to teach school and proclaim the gospel. He traveled to dangerous places, making Yeshua known. In 1940, the Japanese evaded China, and he sent his wife, his two kids, and his own unborn child back to Canada, and he stayed. And as he stayed, he got put in a internment camp. And he was in a internment camp for many years. But see, he didn't quit, he didn't cry, he stayed focused on Yeshua. 
not only did he stay focused on Yeshua, there were children that came who lost their parents or were separated from their parents. He discipled them. He taught them. He, he showed them how to have a quiet time. He stayed faithful in the midst of the storm. Not only that, he was, he was a kind man, he was a faithful man, and he was selfless. He had an opportunity to leave the internment camp. He had an opportunity to leave, but he stayed at the internment camp and let a woman and her own unborn child leave the camp. You know, he could have gone home. He could have suffered for Yeshua. He could have counted the cost. He paid his dues, but he placed that woman's life and her child before his own life. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, it says this. Therefore, if, if there's any consolation in Messiah, if any comfort or love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than them himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Eric looked out for others' interests before his. Verse 5 says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also Messiah Yeshua, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself a no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the parents as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of the death and even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has exactly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Yeshua, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth, and that every ting tongue should confess Messiah, confess that Messiah Yeshua is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Eric, he had fame. He was popular. He could have stayed in England, but he decided to go to China. He could have left China, but he stayed because he knew that those souls, those lives were more important than him. Even though he doesn't get to see his wife ever again or his children ever again, he will get to see them one day in heaven. Richard Warmbrand. How many people know Richard Warmbrand? Voice of the martyrs, right? He's a Jewish believer and Messiah. He risked everything, 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 his family, his reputation, his life, to share the gospel in Romania. In 1944, communists seized power and the Romania and Russian troops poured into the country. Richard Warbrand ministered to his oppressed fellow countrymen and to the Russian soldiers by printing one million Gospels of John. In 1945, Richard and his wife Sabrina attended the Congress of the Colts as many religious leaders come forward to swear loyalty to the Communist Party. Sabrina tells her husband to wipe the shame from the face of Yeshua, Jesus. Richard, knowing the cost, steps forward and stands up for Yeshua, stands up for the word of God, knowing that he could be put in a prison, that he could be suffer. He risked everything to start stand up for Yeshua and the gospel. In 1948, the secret police kidnapped Richard and make him prisoner number one. He was put in a cell underground, 12 feet, no colors, no sound, no light, no flowers. And the only voice he ever heard was those who came to torture him. He stood, he fought, he didn't give up on Yeshua. Not only that, imagine if you were put underground. Imagine if you had no light. Imagine if you could hear no music that you cannot talk to anybody else. Would you be able to stand for Yeshua? Would you be able to say, I'm not going to forsake Yeshua. I'm not going to forsake the word of God, but I'm going to stay strong. I'm going to hold on to the truth no matter what it costs me. See, he got released. He got released. But you know what he did after he got released? He went back and worked for the underground church and he preached the gospel. 
He knew the risk that he could go back to prison, and he went back to prison, and he suffered. He, was, he, he, was, he suffered so much that he could hardly wear shoes, and he, a lot of times he had to be barefoot in order to speak because of the pain that he got, psychological and physical. And not only that, while he was in prison, he shared the gospel. He shared the gospel to the prison guards. He shared the gospel to those who tortured him and, and, and treated him very, very badly. So he was released. And so let's go on to Corey Tim Boone. We know Corey Tim Boone, right? Everybody know Tori Tim Boone, right? She was a follower of Yeshua. Her family risked everything to save Jewish people in their safe house. They knew what the costs would be. And what's interesting is they had an informant who ratted on them. And her father went to prison. She went to prison. Her sister went to prison. Her father died 10 days later, and they were put into a concentration camp. And her sister and her, they were beaten. They were tortured. They went through a lot. They went through a lot. But in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the storm, they were able to be a light. They were able to sneak in a little Bible. And they had this Bible in their hand. And they lived in a room that had 700 people in it. And it was so dirty and filthy that they had lice. And none of the guards would want to go into that room because they were afraid to get lice. They were afraid to get sick. But you know what God did? He used that for the gospel because they were able to preach the gospel inside that room with, with being inconvenienced. And not only that, some came to faith. Some have eternity for the rest of their life. And what's very, very interesting is this. Some of them, after they came to faith, they went to the gas chambers. They went to the gas chambers, but they found salvation before then. They found. So 600 people were killed every day in this concentration camp. 97,000 women died in the concentration camp. And what's very interesting is her sister died in that concentration camp. But God pulled a miracle because Corey Tim Boone was let go through a clerical error. And when she left, she found out later that all the women her age were murdered. But she was let go. See, she is a woman of faith, a woman of character. But what I love about her more is her forgiveness. See, the person who turned him and her family, he died of war crimes. But before he died, before he died, she found out about him. She sent him a Bible and a letter saying, I forgive you because of what Yeshua has done in my life. That's forgive forgiveness. Could we do that? If someone destroyed our family, if someone ruined our lives, could we forgive them like her? So that's uh, Corey Tim Boone. So why were Eric Little, Richard Warren Brand, Corey Tim Boone able to endure such hardship? Why were they able to finish the race that God set before them? Let's go to Luke chapter 6, 46 through 49. Yeshua says this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and listens to my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what he's like. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on bedrock. When a flood came, the rivers burst against the ha that house, but could not shake it because it had been well built. But the person who hears and does not put my words into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the river burst against the house, it collapsed immediately and was utterly destroyed. See, their foundation was Yeshua. Their foundation was Yeshua. If you're in the Messianic movement or in the church world, it's very important that we get this. Our house be built on Yeshua. Because when we keep our eyes on him, we can withstand the storms. Can you put that picture of the house up for me real quick? This house right here. This is Galveston. 
Hurricane Ike, I believe, was 2008. This house withstood the storms of life. Look at all the other houses. Gone. Look at the roads. Look at everything. Gone. Cars, you name it, gone. This house stood. I want to use this picture to say we can stand the storms of life if we will put Yeshua first. We can stand the storms of life if he's our foundation. We can stand the storms of life if he's truly, truly, truly first in our life and not second. So I want you just to look at that picture a second and imagine if the storms of life came, would you stand? If the spiritual storms, the physical storms came, if you were like, if you were in a situation like Richard Warren Brand, if you were in a situation like Corey Tim Boone or Eric Little, would you be able to stand? And are you standing now? See, we don't have the persecution like they did. We're not going through the fire like they did. I'm not saying we're not going through the fire. I'm not saying we're not struggling. I'm not saying we don't have our issues or problems, but it does not compare to their lives. So when you're going through an issue, when you're struggling, remember their lives. God sustained them. God gave them peace in the midst of suffering. God gave them the strength to endure, and he can give us the strength to endure no matter what comes our way. You and I can be the house that stands. Not only stands when storms come, but we can be the house that stands for others, others who go through the storm. Okay, okay let's move on to Hebrews 12, chapter 1 through 2. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, they counted the cross, they counted the cost. They were willing to sacrifice and suffer for Messiah Yeshua. They kept their eyes on Yeshua and during the race. We're called to do the same thing. See, I've seen, like I said, I've seen people in the Messianic movement and the rest of the body of Messiah who got their eyes off Yeshua and placed it on tradition, placed it on knowledge, placed it on things of the world, lust of the flesh and walked away from the race that God gave them. I know people who have come to this congregation. I know people who, were, who went to church, and they left. They grew up, and they left. They walked away from Yeshua. They walked away for tradition. They walked away for the world. And it, it, it grieves my heart. It grieves my heart because they're missing out on the ultimate prize, pursuing another prize. You see, the goal of Satan for us is to walk away from the race or keep you and I running from the race that God has set before us. He wants us to place our eyes, our thoughts, our desires, and focus on something other than Yeshua. Is there anything in your life more important than Yeshua? Do you spend more time with something else than Yeshua? You know, in this world, we have a lot of distractions. We have Netflix. <laughs> Think about Netflix. You can watch a series. You can watch shows. You can spend hours and hours. I've done this. You can spend hours <laughs> of, 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 of binge watching. But in a light of eternity, what is that worth? In a light of an eternity, it's not going to make a difference. We have billboards. We have music. We have politics. We have so many distractions getting attention of our life and taking us in the wrong direction. The question is, are you in the right direction? Are you on that narrow road or are you on the right road? Are you pursuing Yeshua, or are you pursuing something else? May we all pursue Yeshua, who is the most important thing in our life. Amen. He's what's going to keep us. He's what's going to give us the strength. He's going to be there when nobody else is there. He's going to be there to give you what you need when nobody else will be there to give you. And that's very important. So we need to fix our eyes on eternity, on Yeshua. It needs to be about Him, His commandments, His love, and His kingdom. See, you and I don't know how great we have it in America. We have access to the Bible. We have access to Yeshua. I can go on our internet and I can search any scripture I want. I can go on the internet and I can listen to the gospel anytime I want to. I can go on the internet and listen to all these sermons. I can listen to David's great sermons and other people's great sermons here. We have been given so much, so much 
But the question is, what are we doing with what we've been given? Are we making a difference in the lives of others? Are we proclaiming the gospel? Are we being a light to others? You know, this past Thursday, they had their international students come. And I decided to come. I didn't want to come. I'm going to be, be honest with you. I've been working. I guess just started a new job. I was working on this message. I was doing other stuff. I was getting like three, four hours of sleep and really did not want to come. But I decided to come. You know what I did? I was out, outside just welcome. Sign your name tag. That gave me the greatest joy and the greatest feeling I've had in a long time. I didn't share the gospel. I didn't pass out a track. I just showed the love of Messiah. Yeah. And that's what we're called to do, is show the love of Messiah. And that's very, very important to do. You see, there are 7.4 billion people in the world. 7.4. Four billion people. How many of those people have heard the name of Yeshua? How many of those people have ever read the Bible? How many of those people even know who Yeshua is? See, you and I are called to bring the news to them. We're called to bring Yeshua to them. We're called to pray for them. We're called to stand in the gap for them because nobody else will but us. And that's important. There are 132 million children worldwide that are orphans. Think about that. How many children do not have a parent? How many children are living in the dump? How many children have to go to the dump just to find food? How many children are in prostitution? Because they don't have any other, any other means to support themselves. It saddens my heart. Because I know in my heart, and this is what I've been praying to the Lord, is I don't care about them. I don't pray for them. I don't stand a gap for them. I, I may every once in a while I pray for them, but they're really not on my heart. I don't really care about them. And we're called to care about them. There are 30 million slaves worldwide, 60,000 in the United States. And that means these are, these are people who are living as forced laborers, forced prostitutes, child soldiers, and child brides and forced marriages. See, when I was in Thailand, I had an opportunity to go to the district where the prostitutes were. I didn't go into the bar. The women went, and they built relationships with these women. And they just went. They gave them flowers. They talked to them. The guys were way over there worshiping, praying for them. And a great highlight for me was the last weekend I was there, two girls came to faith and were leaving that business. Because they were there to show love. They were there to be a light. And I got to see it. It was an amazing, amazing thing. And so we're called to do that. There are so many people out there that need Yeshua, and we're called to bring the good news to them. So I would challenge you to be a light. I would challenge you to share the gospel. I would challenge you to get out of our comfort zones and be a light. See, the biggest problem that I have and a lot of us have in the Western world is we don't like to be inconvenienced. We don't like to suffer. We don't like to be rejected. But Yeshua's worth it. We must step out because he's worth it. We must step out because he saved your life, he saved my life, and he has others he wants to know be saved. So we're called to do that. Now, I know this evangelist. I read about him and I heard about him. I don't know his name. He's in the Sudan. He's risked everything to share the gospel. He's gone through all kinds of obstacles. He's had his feet. He has no feet. They chopped off his feet. So he shares the gospel while riding a donkey or crawling on his knees. He did not let persecution, he did not let suffering prevent him from sharing the gospel. He doesn't have the resources we have. He doesn't have the tracks we have. He doesn't have gadgets that we have. He doesn't have a car. But he's willing to pay the price to make Yeshua known. And that's very important. See, the reason why he's able to do that is he lives a crucified life and he trusts in Yeshua. Galatians chapter 2, 20 says this, I've been crucified with Messiah. It is no longer I who live, but, Mes but Messiah that lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me 
and gave himself for me. Who do you and I live for? Do we live for Yeshua? Is he number one in our life? Or is it me, myself, and I? Many times in my life it's been all about me. It's been all about my goals, my dreams, what I'm going to accomplish. And it's not about Yeshua. So we need to live a crucified life. We need to put Yeshua first. Another thing, he no longer lives for himself. He lives for Yeshua. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for, uh, verse 14 to 15, it says this, For the love of Messiah compel, compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Who are we living for? Are we living for Yeshua? Are we living for ourselves? See, there are many people around us, our neighbors, strangers, co-workers who do not know Yeshua. And we're called to be that light. We're called to bring the eternal price to them. So, you know, it's not just these people. I know people that are in Thailand who are proclaiming the good news. They are proclaiming the good news. They're not only just in Thailand, but they're going to Cambodia. They're going to Vietnam. They're going to Laos. They're going to India to share the gospel. They're willing to risk all. I know people in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Who's been to Brooklyn? Right? To share the gospel. To share the gospel to the Jewish people. We're called as a Messianic congregation to share the gospel to the Jewish people and to be a light. So, I know this is a short message, but I have a question for you. If you had family members and you know they were going to pass away in the next six months, what would you do? Would you pray for them? Would you share the gospel with them? Or would we um, just continue living? We have family members. We have people we know. We don't know when it's their time. We don't know when it's their time. We've had people in this congregation who have passed away who I love. And we just don't know when it's their time. So I would challenge you guys and challenge myself to pray and intercede on behalf of of your family, on behalf of the international students, on behalf of the Jewish people, I would say, get out of your comfort zone. Pray fast. Get out of your comfort zone and cry out to God. Get out of your comfort zone and give someone a cup of water. Get out of your comfort zone and walk up to the stranger and ask them how they're doing and be a light to them. Get out of your comfort zone and talk to your neighbors. Get out of your comfort zone and go out in the street and feed the lost. These are things that we can do individually and as a congregation. So I'm going to end in prayer. Then I want to pray, uh, play a song. And I want you to close your eyes. I want to listen to the song. And I want you to ask yourself, are you ready? Are you ready? Heavenly Father, I just come to you today, and I thank you for this message, Lord. I know it's a short, brief message, Lord. But Lord, I pray that these scriptures would fall upon their heart, upon their mind. I pray, Father God, that we all would just review ourselves and ask ourselves, are you first in our life? Are we running the race? Do we know what the race is? I ask you, Lord, to pour out your spirit in this place. I ask you, Lord, to raise up people who will be lights. And I thank you for those who are being lights. I pray, Father God, help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to glorify you. Help us to honor you. Help us to make Yeshua known. Mishim Yeshua, amen. For more information, visit us at www.etzheim.org. That's spelled E-I-T-Z dash C-H-A-I-M dot org or join us in Richardson, Texas for our weekly Shabbat services.